Hey, everybody. How you doing? Well, that's good. Welcome to PHLY Flyers. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of fun and games for the evening. Joining me today, Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. Happy Eclipse Day, Charlie. Happy Eclipse Day. The Eclipse is apparently going on as we speak. So thank you for joining this show instead of watching the Eclipse. I guess it's possible you could be watching this later, though, and then maybe you did see the Eclipse when it happened. Bill, I got to ask... <laughs> Did you enjoy your wrestling weekend? I thoroughly enjoyed my wrestling <laughs> weekend, Charlie. It started around 11 a.m. On, uh, on Thursday after our show. And I've been going strong since then. Uh, I did Gargano's show this morning. I basically went home, napped, came back. It's been, it's been going hard. It's been so much fun, though. Uh, getting to see everything at the length the last couple of nights was absolutely incredible. Seeing that in our city was so much freaking fun. Like, I, I just watched The Undertaker choke slam The Rock. That's what was going on when I was nine years old. And then I saw it happen in front of 75,000 people at the <laughs> link. It was, it was, you had to just go, like, how's this happening? Like, how is this really going on right now? But it was so much fun. I think everyone kind of agrees it was a successful WrestleMania. And now you're recuperating with your Olipop. Yeah. Your now prebiotics. We have- now we have the Ollie Pop. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming you were drinking other things this weekend. Perhaps I, some of that chill Coors Light. Uh, <laughs> c- quite a few, quite a few of the, uh, quite a few of the Coors Lights this weekend. It was, it's been a, it's, it's been a real test of endurance. I bet. And uh, but now we're back, and. Things haven't been going well for the Flyers. Yeah, yeah. Things <laughs> just got worse in your That's, absence, Bill. You know, I was like, every now and then checking my phone during the games, checking out Twitter between shows and stuff, Friday and Saturday. I was like, oh, people don't seem too happy. Well, I'm having good. the time of my life over here, and <laughs> doesn't seem as if everyone else quite agrees. And I had some time over the last couple of mornings to kind of catch up on the post games, read your article. Thought your article really. Uh, made some great points just in terms of like where this team was and like your what you, it depends on what your expectations were once they started to look good. Yeah. Like if you go back to the beginning, you're like, well, I did way better. You yeah. know, like just in terms of my vacation, like when I bought these WrestleMania tickets shortly after we launched PHLY, I was like, oh, those two games Friday and Saturday. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Those games aren't going to matter. And the games won't have mattered for a month. I think the only, and, uh, hilariously and enough, of course, this shows how much things have changed yeah. over the last five months. I think probably the only concern I had when you told me that, uh, that you were going to be missing some shows at the end of the season of WrestleMania was, oh, geez, is he going to miss Cutter Gauthier's debut? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, what? A year, Charlie, and now the Flyers have lost seven in a row. Most recently, they lose back-to-backs Friday, Saturday, 4-2 to Buffalo and 6-2 to Columbus. Yeah, I mean, that Columbus, that's that's like an AHL team yeah. right there. Um, they Six did, goals by defensemen. They did not show up to play in the first period. They, they got slightly better as the game went on. I didn't think they played well the entirety, but that first period was embarrassing and i talked to a few of the players today like i talked to scott lawton and he straight up said like that was that was unacceptable the way we played in the first they got they get the the four minute power play which it's their power play it's terrible but coming out of that power play columbus was the better team and they carried the play they ended up i believe the number was um 30 shot attempts at five on five and the flyers had 10 it was like yeah it was like three to one i saw in your tweet yeah wild that and columbus When they're healthy, they're a bad team. Yeah. And they were missing 10 guys. And they still walked all over the Flyers. Like, they might not have 10 NHL caliber guys when they're healthy. And they were missing 10 dudes and beat the Flyers 6-2. They started started a goalie named Jet Greaves. Jet Greaves, Who I watched play for 60 minutes, and I'm still not sure is a real person. I remember seeing it was... He made his debut last year. I, I feel He's, like I remember he played in I think five games before this. Okay, I, I feel like I remember seeing his name like when I was doing the betting show last year and going, "Well, this is a this is a creative player, yeah. so we're going to be betting against him tonight." Like, <laughs> but I just things don't seem to be going well. And when you check the standings, it it's not over. It's not over, but, even though it feels over. Yeah, it's you, you see them now. They are uh, behind Washington all the way there. Detroit is in that second wild card spot. The Islanders have captured the third position. Uh, they have a game in hand. Washington has a game in hand. Pittsburgh have a game in hand. So it's not going great. Like, 
Not great, Bob. <laughs> Does this come down to... Obviously, it's never just going to be one thing. It's a million things. Like, starting with they were never that good to begin with. You know, if Jersey just lives up to expectations this year... It doesn't matter how good the Flyers play. Yeah. Like, but just they were the, never going to be. Yeah. A, well, th that's part of the reason why I was getting frustrated on Twitter yeah. on Saturday, I believe, be about Penguins fans going crazy. And it's like, like, congrats. Your team is finally playing the way they should have been playing all year. You acquired cool. Eric Carlson. <laughs> and the Flyers went into the year with, like, 75% of one goalie. Yeah. Like, a question mark of yeah. a question mark. Yeah, but it was just, it was wild to me. This isn't. The Penguins surge. This is not an example of like an underdog. This is the <laughs> this is the favorite waking up and realizing that oh shit, we're actually pretty good. I, I mean, we're having conversations this year about Crosby on the all time Mount Rushmore, and there, <laughs> that's I'm glad I'm not on Twitter for that this weekend because <laughs> that's just comical. Yeah. Like you, you have two guys. Going to the Hall of Fame, Latang will probably go too because you know he's so famous. Yeah, and Carlson. Uh, and like, three. and then you go and get yeah. Eric Carlson. Yeah, <laughs> like he just he's coming off a hundred point season yeah. and a Norris Trophy. Yeah, like, con congrats, you are doing exactly <sighs> what you were supposed to do going into the year. This is a groundbreaking achievement. But going back to kind of what we were talking about, if this was any one thing, and again, it's not. Is this just a matter of like, yeah, man, they've had. Like since mid February, eight forty nine goaltending. Yeah. Like what you you lose when that happens. You could have an all star team. Like if, you you could have McDavid and McKinnon, and yeah. if you're getting eight fifty, you're not making the playoffs. Yeah, and we talked about that on the post game on Saturday. Me, Kelly, and JP. Um, I made the joke that it's kind of like the meme with the space fan staring at the Earth, and it's like, <laughs> always, is is it always goal? Is it always been goaltending? It always has always been. Has been. Like yeah. that's the thing. You can do a lot of things well, but if the goalies aren't stopping pucks, you're not going to win many games. It's not the only thing, to it's, be sure. Sure. But, yes, since since the losing streak has begun, since the seven-game losing streak has begun, the Flyers have gotten sub-80% goaltending, which means that one out of every five shots on goal is going in the net. Like, you're not going to win with that. It's, it's not. It's literally impossible to win that way. Yeah. And now we take a look at the... Uh, We'll take a look at my color wheel, the money puck standings, because I uh, play off odds because I find them pleasing we're, to we're the eye. We're going to have to zoom in because it's yeah. getting hard. <laughs> and even the most optimistic of yeah. uh, of models, the money puck model, has the Flyers now, what, 24.9, so sub 25% uh, yeah, chance. One in four. Yeah, uh, to make the postseason. Uh, it's crazy it fell apart like this quickly. Yeah. Just considering, I know it's not as if they blew us away during that seven game, you know, the gauntlet against all the top best teams in the tough. East. They played well in five of those seven. Like the first two, they got killed and it was like, oh shit, things are falling apart. And then they pulled the nose up. They won a couple of games. They got a loser point in there. And even the two games they lost at the end, it was like, yo, if they play like this in the next seven, they're going to be seven and up. Yeah. Yeah. And, I thought, I very much thought that. And. It did not go that no, way. No, like, it went the complete opposite way. Charlie, what the hell has happened to this team? Is it just the inevitable finally happening or something else? Well, again, it's a lot of things. I do think at its core, this does lead back to the goaltending. And we, we talked to John Tortorella today after practice, and he was very open about the goalie situation. He, he more or less said, and it wasn't in a cruel way, but he's like, it's not a blame game, but we struggled a bit in goal. And then he goes in and he's like, everybody throws the numbers that are out there and the numbers are bad, which they are. We just talked about them. But we're not even talking about these games meaning anything for us if Eris doesn't play the way he's played, presumably the way he's played before the stretch. Yeah. And I don't think he's wrong. No, we talked, like, even when the numbers were dipping or he'd have a game where it's like, you know, really three on 16 shots or whatever. And it was, yeah, but those, you know, 13 saves were all, like, on A-plus scoring yeah, chances. Yeah, all 10 bell. Like, it was... He was playing well, even though the numbers didn't really look like it. And then it was just, yo, he looks like Felix Sandstrom all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah. Like, is that kind of... I think so. And and we got as much of an admission from Torts today. He basically said, and he this actually I thought was the best version of Torts taking accountability, be even more so than last week when everybody praised him for it. I thought this statement was probably the best one that he's done so far, which was, I made the decision I'm going to live or die with Eris when I played him all those games. 
I did not have the confidence, and it's certainly not a criticism. It's just my assessment of Sandy, as in Felix Sandstrom. I made the decision that we're going with Eris. I played the hell out of him. He's tired. I mean, and that's, it's a coach basically saying, look, I didn't trust the backup, so I gambled that Erson yeah. would be able to hold up to an insane workload, and he hasn't been able to hold up to an insane workload, and now we're kind of screwed. And it's hard to say things would have turned out differently considering the backups. I guess if at the trade deadline, Danny Briere makes a concerted effort to yeah. fix the goalie situation. Now, we didn't know they were working on the Fedotov thing. Also, like, what could you expect? And, and Kolosov, for yeah, that matter. and yeah. Kolosov, but also what could you have expected like really from those guys, we're all excited, but it's like, this isn't definitely a solution, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, if they put Sandstrom in there, if they put Cal Peterson in there, I'm not saying it turns out any different. And I, that's why I'm not going to criticize John Tortorella for this. Cause it was my opinion too. Yeah. They just run roll the dice that he can live through it yeah. and it didn't work, but you didn't have an alternative. Yeah. Like the alternative was, was let's play six skaters. Basically, because yeah. that's what Felix yeah. Sandstrom was. Yeah, just pull the goalie. Yeah, ball just wow, we're gonna play sixty <laughs> minutes and hope we can possess the puck. Yeah. Now, considering what the Flyers' power play is, it probably wouldn't have worked either. <laughs> but <laughs> like, no, point. it was. I I I appreciate that he's taking accountability for this, and it is a decision he made, and it is ultimately. Listen, look at Eris's numbers; they're bad now. Yeah. I think it's the right call. It could have worked. It didn't. Yeah. The end. Sometimes you like we were in the media room today. And Kevin Kurser, writes for The Athletic, said, who do you go and goal on Tuesday? And we were chatting about it. And I basically said, Brian Boucher. I basically said, you know what, Kevin? Like, and I'm not, I wasn't saying this to be critical. I mean, it was like, I don't think there's a good answer here. No. Because, <laughs> like, you go with Fedotov. He looked real bad on Friday. He looked like the guy who I was afraid they were going to get on Monday. He very much looked like a guy still breaking in his equipment, still getting used to the NHL. He did not look sharp at all. So you go him, and you might get that guy again, or you go Arison, who's clearly tired. I mean, he got four days off and looked just as tired on Saturday as he looked on Monday. There is no good answer. I'm not going to kill John Tortorella, whoever he picks, because they're both bad options. Yeah. They don't have a good option. This is just like, well, I hope the guy I pick plays well enough to keep us in the game, and then we start scoring some frigging goals, which is another problem. They're not scoring enough either. No, and that's like it, when I said like, you know, if it was just one thing, it's the goaltending. However, it's not. It's and not. You, There's like you see things. the Columbus game, the guy oh like the guys who score are Ula Lixell and Adam Jennings. Yeah, that was wild. Like, when those two are your only goal scorers, you probably lost. Yes, like your guys didn't show up, and that's kind of just what happened there. I see we have a super chat, a super chat from Gary, uh, from B. Gary, Gary B. Gary B had a lot of super chats on Saturday, so he's just keeping this going. Thanks so much, Gary uh lfg says, flyers yeah. let's fucking go flyers it kills me to think flyers won't be playing in two weeks goalies like i said saturday is a huge problem it is indeed but as you say it's not the only thing and there's we really went through all of the blame um on saturday night there's a lot to go around i mean torts isn't isn't blameless by no. any means if we're gonna give him all the praise like i said yes. I, on thursday or whatever before i took my you know leave of absence uh, like if we're going to give Torts all the credit for the first 60 games or whatever, mm -hmm. well, well, things fell apart at the end. Yeah. You're, a, you're as much a part of this. You're the face of the damn franchise. Yeah. It's like you gritty the players, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, he's going to take, yeah. whether it's deserved or not, he's going to take the criticism and it's probably deserved. And it's reasonable too, to say that one, I mean, because even setting aside the goaltending, I also think that guys are tired. And one of the reasons why guys are tired is due to the decisions that John Tortorella made in terms of deployment. Like, I don't know if Sean Couturier would, and obviously he's been injured the last couple of games. He did practice today in a yellow non-contact jersey, so he could be back tomorrow. I think he'll probably at least be back Thursday, or yeah, Thursday is when they play in New York. I expect him to play in that game. But point being is that I don't know if Sean Couturier would be playing better now had he not gotten 20 minutes a night through the middle of January. But he might be. Maybe they did wear him out because they didn't know what he could take post-back surgery. Now they know he can't take that, or at least he couldn't take that this year. Then you've got guys like Cam York and Travis Sanheim, who they, they made a decision. We're going to play them 30 minutes a night because our defense is injured and we don't feel like playing a bunch of rookies and you know veterans who really can't skate anymore um, 20 minutes. So they're taking the minutes. It worked in the short term. Now they're seeing the negative impacts. 
Kelly brought up something that was interesting, and I didn't even think of this, but the the obsession with 11-7. Do I understand why they did it for that long? Sure, they had a lot of defensemen. The dry sale trade changed things, but did that maybe have a cumulative effect on some of the forwards? I hadn't maybe, even thought of that. And that's a really, really... And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second and some of Torts' decisions, but I got to talk to you about Olipop because if you're making soda decisions and not picking Olipop, I think you're messing up. Listen, Olipop is the world's first functional soda with a classic soda taste and the benefits of plant-based fiber, prebiotics, and other botanical ingredients to support gut health. Olipop is a new kind of soda with only two to five grams of sugar per can, and it's also got nine, nine grams of, pro, of fiber per can. I can get this. I'm back. Uh, two out of three Americans say they suffer from digestive issues, and 95% of Americans don't get the daily recommended amount of fiber. Fiber. Olipop is tackling both these issues with a drink that tastes just like soda. Prebiotic fiber is the food source for the beneficial probiotic bacteria in your gut, and Olipop has nine grams of prebiotic fiber in every can that can help support your digestive health. And when you've got a gut like mine, you've got to keep it healthy, fam. <laughs> Olipop is available online and available in almost 30,000 retailers nationwide, including the most recent launch at all Wawa stores. Olipop's debut in Wawa couldn't be more of a match made in heaven, a delicious, healthy drink, Meets a convenience store where we get everything else for our day already. Now you can get your sandwich and get your snack and then get a tasty soda that won't leave you feeling guilty about drinking a can of poison because that's not what Olipop is. And the two flavors debuting in Wawa are classic root beer and strawberry vanilla. I told you a bunch of times I'm more of a cola kind of guy. I, uh, I've been drinking this root beer though and I kind of align in terms of regular root beer with the Hanson brothers, you know? None of that stinking root beer. No. <laughs> This stuff actually really good. The Olipop root beer is actually some of the better root beer I've ever had in my life. And you can get it now uh, either in Wawa or online. Use code PHLY20 for 20% off your next order of Olipop. Discount only applies to one-time orders, not to subscription orders. Olipop is sold online at drinkolipop.com and available in almost 30,000 retailers nationwide, including Wawa, Target, Sprouts, Wegmans, ShopRite and GoPuff. And I suggest you use that PHLY20 code at drinkolipop.com on this watermelon line. This is actually my favorite flavor. It's really refreshing. Like it's not heavy like a soda. It's more like a uh, like a like a seltzer or something a little yeah, lighter. I, I, I I've had, been really liking the watermelon lime. I had the lemon lime one yeah. uh, on Friday, I guess. And what I think it's cool about it is it it kind of has like almost a juicy yeah. taste. It's more, it's less, less like the carbonated when you get like, and I love Sprite, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. But like that hits you with like the carbonated burst. Whereas mm -hmm. this was more of like a juice rather than a soda, which I thought was cool. No, like I'm drinking this can of soda right now and I don't feel as if sitting here doing the show with you, I'm just going to be blowing yeah, to be gas in your exactly, face. Exactly, exactly. Like this is a little bit lighter than that. So I, I really have been enjoying the Olipop. I think you will too. Check it out at drinkolipop.com. Use promo code PHLY20. I see we have another super Ooh, chat. Super chat. From, uh, <clears throat> I can't see that. What is this? Uh, Vinet Singh. Vinet Singh. Uh, what explains them going blow for blow against the best teams during the gauntlet and then collapsing against the bottom feeders? Love the show. So that <sighs> is that's the, like the, that, like that, that has happened is the question. Yeah, that's the really frustrating part because we talked about this Saturday as well. The idea that if they would have lost seven straight against the great teams, and you put that in your article, like yeah, that would have made sense. That would have made sense. It'd been like okay, that's a bummer, but we get it. Yeah. The fact that, and obviously the seven-game losing streak started at the end of the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. They have the one game against Florida where they hold them to like 15 shots and mm -hmm. still lose because Felix Sandstrom was terrible. Um, then they have the game against the Rangers where they go shot for shot, goal for goal with them. They lose in overtime because Tortorella throws Ryan Paling out there. Um, <laughs> Outstanding. But, uh, but anyway, um, so those two games, sure. But they were still playing pretty well in both those games. In the first game, it's entirely on the goalie yeah second game the third period was maybe the most entertaining third period i've seen in the nhl all season yes. it was wild and then you're thinking okay now the schedule eases up mm -hmm. and the fact that it's not even that they're playing great against these teams and just getting unlucky like they didn't play great against montreal they certainly didn't play great against against chicago they played legitimately awful against columbus yes buffalo like that game i thought they played fine it was just Fedotov did not look good, mm -hmm. and they didn't finish on their chances. But, like, 
it's still Buffalo. They're they're nothing special. Yeah, they're below you in the standings, yeah. and like you were supposed to be bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and you were beating teams way better than Buffalo. Yes, a week and a half earlier. Considerably, is it just like this was it? Like the tank is now empty, and that leads me to what I wanted to ask about Tortorella. Like more so than like his micro decisions, like eleven seven, or a deployment of Sean Couturier and Travis Sanheim. The way, and we've talked about it a little, just like they play in exhausting style. They do. Is it unrealistic to ask a team to do this for 82 games and then like expect them to be good to go at the end of the season? Like say they were preparing for the playoffs right now. Like they win a few more when they were actually playing well. And now they're like, they've clinched or at least it's like a 98% chance on money puck or something. It's like, all right, I wonder who they're going to have in the first round. Like as things sort of even out. They'd be out of gas even if that was the case, wouldn't yeah, it? I, I'm not ready to say that because I've heard some people make the argument that like this is why John Tortorella hasn't won a Stanley Cup since the mid-2000s because he runs his teams into the ground during the season. They had nothing left in the playoffs. I can't speak. I, I don't play for John Tortorella. Yeah. I can't speak to whether that was the reason every year. That said... They did go out in the first round the year um, they played the Tampa Bay Lightning and beat the best team ever, and they didn't seem tired. That Blue Jackets team didn't seem tired then. So I think the way that he did it this time, yes, this cannot be sustained. You can't have guys like York and Sanheim be playing 30 minutes a night for a month straight and Sam Harrison as a, <laughs> as a rookie getting every single game. Like, that was unsustainable. Basically, no fourth line for yeah. a lot of the year. You're going 11-7, and it's like, well, one of the 11 is Nick Delorier, so guess what? You have 10. We have 10. Yeah. And, uh, like, we have no third pair. You know, yeah. we're just going to run out 30 minutes a game. Like, we're going to play it like it's a playoff game with the defensemen and, like you said, with the goalies. Like, all right, if it's you're playing this style and that's my thing. we have yes. Sean Couturier coming back from missing basically two full seasons, and we don't know what his back's going to be able to take. Well, guess what, dude? You're playing one C minutes, and you're you're back to your old workload already. Yeah, I guess if you combine the two things, that's kind of where I'm at. But like, if it's I, a, if, I think just the style, I think they would have been able to handle it. I can't say that for sure, but I think they would. I don't think this is too demanding of a style okay. for an NHL team to sustain it over 82 games. I do think it's too demanding of a style if you're also giving guys insane workloads in addition to that. And I think on some level, John Tortorella probably realizes it, that you know he was taking a risk. But his view, and I don't necessarily think he's wrong, as we talked about earlier, that his view is that if I didn't do this, we would have been out of the playoff race a month ago. Like if I would have given Felix Sandstrom every third start, we would have lost four more games. Yeah. And if I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have given Cam York and Travis Sanheim all those minutes, then instead of Eric Johnson being on the ice for like 14 goals against, he would have been on the ice for 28 goals against. Like I understand why he made the calculation he did at every turn. But what's undeniable is that by making that calculation at every turn where I'm going to pile more work and more of a load on the guys I trust, now a lot of those guys appear to be cooked and you're seeing what happens. Is this like when you, oh, well, if I had done this, we would have been out of, I guess this is just the hole in the plan, or at least as some people might see it. Like, yeah, it was going to take all of that just to maybe get in yeah. like a lucky, like the Metro's bad. So you get in lucky in the three spot or you get into a wild card and then you lose in the first round. Was it worth it? Like, do you think like it was important for everyone that they play these important games down the stretch, whether they got in or not. Like I said with Gargano this morning, right? Like Keith Jones is standing there telling me and you like looking us in the face and saying the playoffs are not the priority. And then Danny Breer goes out and trades probably their most effective defenseman to prove that point. Right. Like it was never the goal, like the stated goal. We need to make playoffs this year. It was always just like, we want to see this team in competitive situations. And like, yeah, Morgan Frost had a great end of the year last year. They were exhibition games. So who knows what he really is? You know, they wanted to get information about guys. Was it worth it, do you, like, instead of a top five pick or something? I mean, I don't know. Look, obviously getting a top five pick would be great because we know this team needs high-end talent. You have a better chance of getting high-end talent the higher up you pick in the draft. However, I do think that there were 
there have been, let's not say the season's over yet, there have yep. been positive signs in terms of player development at the NHL level that would have made it very difficult for this team to be bad enough to get a top five pick, regardless of the way John Tortorella coached the team. Like, I love what I've seen from Tyson Forrester. I really liked what I saw in the first two thir two thirds of the year from from Joel Farabee. I I know that this end of the year is going to torpedo his numbers, but I was impressed on the whole by Sam Harrison. I don't think his end of season numbers will reflect the quality of season he had because I know from the fact that I followed the team that he just was cooked at the end of the season. I've seen good things out of a lot, and like that's the thing. If you're going to get a top five pick it almost requires for none of those good things to happen yeah. because to get a top five pick, you have to be real friggin' bad. And to be real friggin' bad, you have to have a lot of guys either stagnate or get worse. And we did see a lot of players like Cam York took a step forward this year. Definitely. I think Travis Sanheim showed that like, that isn't a total disaster There's of a something contract. More, yeah. yeah. I mean, even, and I know his second half has been bad, but like even getting to see for a half of the season that Sean Couturier Maybe he can't take the workload that he could before, but hopefully this means that if you stagger his shifts a bit better in the future, that he can remain a legitimately good top six NHL center. These are all positive things. Yeah. And if you were going to get the top five pick, none of those positive things could have happened. No, like a top five pick would be cool. That would also mean Tyson Forster scored 12 goals, not 20. Yeah. You know, like little things like that along the way. And we got information. And even if it's information we don't like, yeah. like it's still information, you know? And I, I do agree with Ayers. Like I am willing to chalk up, you know, his post, you know, f uh, Valentine's Day numbers basically to, yeah, what'd you expect? Rookie goalie who I think in some of the quotes you have, Torts goes, yeah, we had we had him penciled in for 18, 22 starts this year, yeah. and look where he's at now. Yeah, you know? he's, at, he's at 45. Yeah. So, and like, all right, now, even if it's, uh, we think he's a really good tandem goalie. Maybe he's not a true number one, but if we can get what we got out of him in the first half of the season over the course of a year, if we have another guy to split the shifts or split the games with, that's really strong information to yeah. have. So I'm not willing to say this, like I got a lot of like, you know, not everyone knew I was off this weekend, so got a lot of the tweets like, well, how about the plan now? And like this, I was, I'm just not ready to say it was a total waste of time. And listen, you and I both this summer were like, what, just tear it down. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah. You know? And we can always have that debate, but I always think like, all right, this is kind of, we're talking in circles. We can debate what they should do, but it's what they're doing. Yeah, what so how long doing. can we have that conversation, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I'm willing to, like, a guy like Erson, I like the information we got. I think he's better than his numbers, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he responds next season. Like, for me, it's about next season with Erson. It's okay. This dude, they've run him into the ground. Yeah. It, he was never supposed to play this the, the only way I can see this actually having been a waste of time and actually being count truly counterproductive. And I say this is someone who would like to see the Flyers get a top five pick because I think they need another superstar. They badly need it. They really do. At least, at least one, maybe a couple legitimately star level talent. Maybe they can get one with the 12th overall pick. It's harder. It can be done, but it's harder. That said, the one way that this will have all been a waste of time is if, and I'm not saying that this is what is happening, if the team just tunes out Tortorella as a result of how hard he pushed them to get to this point. Like if, if they kick off, if they kick off next season and it's like, cause the, the, the one comparison I'll, I will make just because I lived it was Vino. Vino kind of sort of lost the room during that, um, not the pandemic shortened season, but the one that was intentionally shortened. Yeah. The, the one where we had no access. 2020, 2021, but yeah. it was all in 2021. It was all in 2021. Yeah. yeah. Um, he pissed a lot of people off and they made changes in the off season. They got rid of ghost. They got rid of Voracek. They added Cam Atkinson. It was very much a, we're trying to regain the room. What happened? It became very clear early in that season that the guys did not forgive Vino for the things that pissed them off about it. Even after they took 
two guys who he who disliked him the most out of the mix in Voracek and Ghost. The team still wasn't listening to him. Yeah, it turns out those guys were very popular. Yeah, taking that it was like, no, get rid of that guy. Yeah, yeah. Like, but my, my <laughs> we point, like each other. My point is, yes, is that yes. if next year starts <gasps> and the team is running around like chickens with their heads cut off because they're not listening to the coach anymore, then in retrospect, it will be like. Yeah, that was really pointless because you you center this whole thing around building culture, and now we're right back to the start where teams quitting on a coach. So I really hope that's not the case. I really hope that you know this is mostly just goaltending and guys being tired. But I guess we'll see because I remember that summer I was not in favor of firing Elaine Vigneault. I was not in the room, but I was like, you know, he was real good the first year. Last year he wasn't. I don't think weird year. Yeah, weird year. Like give him a mulligan. In retrospect, they absolutely should have fired yes. him that summer yeah. because the situation was unsalvageable. We didn't realize it, but you know what? It's not my job to realize it. It's their job to realize it, and they didn't. Yeah. And then they made a bunch of changes to accommodate the coach who no one wanted to play for anymore. Yeah, the coach who really didn't care that much about coaching anymore, according to at least one guy, yeah. Jake Voracek, who— yeah. I don't know. He's a pretty honest dude. Pretty, like, honest, pretty yeah. honest dude. <laughs> one thing you can say, you can say a lot of shit about Jake— he, he ain't a liar. No, he's no, telling he, you what he's thinking. He tells you exactly <laughs> what he thinks. He's telling you what he's thinking. But, but seriously, yeah. like if that's the way it plays out Ex next yeah. season, then I will retroactively be like, this season was a waste of time. But I'm not ready to say that until I actually see like incontrovertible evidence that they've quit on Tortorella, and I haven't seen that. Yet. That's the. It's a. It, it, there it's, are it's a theory, people, but there are people who believe that right now. I think those people are a majority made up of anyone who already didn't like John Tortorella. I think that's the thing, yeah. And it's like, see, this yeah. is what happens. Yeah, they, they, they want and, the team to quit on it because they want yeah. it gone. And that's, listen, it might happen. It could. John Tortorella acknowledged it a couple days ago. Like, sure yeah, did. that follows me around. You know? yeah. They might quit. Yeah, maybe. Um you don't think they have yet, and this is more a function of like, I, I don't even, dog, I, we're dead. Yeah, like, I'm not even going to say I don't think it's happened. I just don't know. Like, I okay. truly don't know if the players are in the process right now of tuning out John Tortorella. What I will say is that I don't think they are in this position if John Tortorella is not the head coach. Like, I think he successfully squeezed a lot of extra points out of this team. Now, granted, right now we're probably seeing the negatives of that because they seem like they're out of gas on multiple levels. But it's hard for me to, because Tortorella was one of the guys on Saturday who we debated how much blame he has for this. And I do think he shares a, a not a significant amount of blame for this seven game skit, because we talked about overworking Harrison, overworking the guys, things like that. Those were decisions he made, but it's hard for me to get too agitated with Tortorella when I don't believe they would even be in the position to have this collapse. If he's not the coach. And if the plan was always, we need to play meaningful games. They're playing Tortor them. Tortorella was like the season extender. Like he's the only one that could make March matter. Yeah. You know, like yeah. guess what? It would have been over the second we lost Carter Hart. Yeah. Um, but we got through February and March with the game still mattering. And then, you know, last three weeks of the season it fell apart. Well, it was gonna fall apart before Christmas, you know. Yeah, like and, and and hopefully this is something I put this in my article. Hopefully, this is something that especially the younger guys can learn from like it's pretty clear they're falling flat on their face and it sucks and everybody's probably frustrated with themselves but if you know if if joel faraby is better two years down the road in clutch situations because he learns that he was putting too much on himself and being too tight and then when he is 26 and the flyers are hopefully not just trying to squeak into the playoffs but like trying to make a run yeah. if he then plays better in those meaningful games because he went through this where he played like shit then that is something they can use that is a positive out of a negative now who knows if he will do that i don't know who knows if he's even going to be here like you never know with the freaking flyers they could trade anybody but <laughs> My point is, is that like, it's true. I do think that some guys are probably tight and maybe they will learn by dealing with this, that I need to adjust my approach for these kinds of games. So I'm not tight in them in the future. I want to get to the, our guys tight thing. And I want to get to the quotes about, well, we knew something was up with Carter Hart, but first I got to say, oh, I just got to tell you about game time. I don't know how I was going <laughs> to lead into that. Uh, game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, 
which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the GameTime app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. And GameTime is the place for last-minute ticket deals. I tell you this all the time. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets. Plus, you have the all-in pricing. You know exactly what you're spending before you push the button. Uh, you get the seat view that came in huge for us uh, when we were getting tickets to the stadium series. That was absolutely outstanding. And the lowest price guarantee. Uh, it's Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And the last-minute deals. I've been telling you about them all season. But you can save up to 60% off. Buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, anything you want to see, any event, any ticketed event. You go last minute, you can save a ton of money with game time. And they have the flash deals. You can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. You take the game time. Jeez, man. Take, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets with, uh, with the app. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code first pitch. Terms apply. That's code F I R S T P I T C H for $20 off all the way up until April 14th. So you still have some time to cash in on this. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price. Guaranteed. You can always use that PHLY code for your first purchase of $20 off. Uh, so all sorts of game time codes for you. But let's start with the are they tight, Charlie. Um, you're t Joel Farabee is a guy. I mean, what's he got? Nine points in the last month. Like it's <laughs> it, It's been going real poorly for him uh, right. since he got off to a really strong start. Was one of, uh, for what, two thirds of the season. One of the success stories of this year. Like we didn't. I was willing to grant him the way I'm granting Erson the mulligan this year and like Sean Couturier, I want to see next year. Let's see how he responds. After last year with Joel Farabee, I was like, listen, he's coming back from the neck thing. He finished pretty strong. Let's see how this year goes. Damn, it went pretty well for a while. For a while, yeah. And then it just totally fell off. If you're going to look at it, maybe he's just tired or is he tight? Like, what is the issue with him? Is he one of the dudes you think Tortorella is referencing? Maybe. <laughs> I think with him, like, he, I don't think he should be tired. That's that's the thing. Like, I look at Cam York and Travis Sanheim. If they're tired, they have every right to be. I'm not going to give them shit for yeah. that. With Joel Farabee, like, I don't know, man. Like, he hasn't been playing first yeah, line minutes. Like, you're, like <laughs> you're 24. You're getting 16 minutes a night. Like, you shouldn't be tired. So, no. I, I mean, if he is... And I'm not saying he is, but if he is, he needs to work That's out a conditioning harder. Yeah, issue. it's a conditioning issue. He needs to work out better in the offseason. I have to believe that this is just he's in a slump. He's in a slump. He can't get out of it. And now he's probably putting even more pressure on himself because the games mean more and he's one of the team's better offensive players and he hasn't been doing shit. And that's uh, uh, Tortorella acknowledges it in one of, the, uh, one of the quotes on who's tight. Like some guys are just struggling at the wrong time. And like everyone goes through slumps. We say yeah. this all the time. No one's good. No one's great, you know, at their absolute best for 82 games. That just doesn't happen. It, Connor McDavid slumped this year. Now, granted, he's still going to be like top three in scoring, probably win the race. But like it happened. It did happen. First 12 games of the year, he didn't look like himself. Guys slump. And sometimes we draw conclusions about when these slump. Well, he slumped at the wrong time of year, so he's a loser. Like maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. There are guys who just aren't as good and big game situations. Sure. There are some guys who do actually step up like Danny Briere. Awesome. Scored more in the playoffs yep. than he did in the regular season. Like that was yep. a guy who became better. Some dudes do that. Some guys go the other way. Do you think we can make those conclusions about Farabee? Maybe Travis Konechny. Is this something to be concerned about? Like, this is what I'm saying when I, uh, this was all information gathering, even if it's information we didn't want. Yeah. We didn't want to find out, like, Travis Konechny is going to not score for five straight games against five bad teams. Yeah. Like, should we be drawing conclusions about that? Like, when guys slump, or is it just kind of luck of the draw? Well, I don't want to say you can't draw any conclusions mm -hmm. because enough people that are in the game and are in positions of being able to make decisions do believe that you can learn something about players what i do think is interesting about it however and tortorella noted this in his big 15 minute presser last week his opinion is that it can be taught that you can get better at upping your level for these kinds of games that he doesn't believe it is that like somebody is just inherently a choker and they're always going to be a choker and that's just who they are 
Tortorella believes that he can teach mindset and he can teach a better approach to these games if the underlying talent's there. Now, is he just blowing smoke? Maybe, but if if it can be taught... If it can't be, that kind of ruins his whole thing about yeah. like why he needs to be the coach of this rebuild. Exactly. So... I don't know. I, 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 again, I don't, I think you guys are being a little hard on connect me, but yeah, he isn't scoring right now. And that sucks. Farabee hasn't been scoring for a month, over a month, probably like about mid February is when this really kicked off. For it's him. like been like 27, 28 yeah. games. Like it would make me feel a lot better. I mean, I guess it wouldn't make him feel a lot better because he wouldn't be feeling good, but like it would make me feel a lot better if he's just, he's one of those guys who like get surgery a, a month, uh, a week after the season's over. And it's like, Oh, that's why that was one of the, like, questions. that's why <laughs> that's one of the things I wanted to ask you next. Like, obviously, uh, Coots is out right now. I believe he practiced, he did practice without that. a non-contact. No, so it, was, it, wearing it, a regular was, jersey. it was the yellow Jersey. It was the non-contact. Oh, it was the non-contact. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but he skated, he did skate though. Uh, like, so clearly he's at least banged up. If yeah, not, it's, injured. The, it's the shoulder. Um, he crashed. Yeah. The I mean, we know what it is. It, it was very obvious what yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, how hurt do you think this team is? Uh, I think they're banged up. No more than like the average. The, yeah, this time of year, everyone's hurt. Yeah, man. I, I, it's hard for me to say. I don't think they are inordinately banged up in comparison to the rest of the league. But I do think that some key guys are definitely playing through things. Like Travis Sanheim is definitely playing through things. Oh, well, that's... Without a yeah. doubt. Without a doubt. Look at the way he was skating. Yeah. Then to now. Yeah. You know? Like he's, he's hurt. Cam York, I know he had the shoulder thing in February. I don't know if that's fully recovered or if it's ever really going to be. Jamie Drysdale, he's back, but I don't think he was ever 100% from the moment the Flyers traded for him. No. That's probably something that's either going to have to be taken care of in the summer or maybe it just is going to require like two months of recuperation to just let it get, let it heal. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, Arison's just tired. I don't think he's hurt. Um, Konechny, I think, probably rushed back too soon for that injury. I do believe we're being too hard on him. Like, even me. Like, I'm one of the people being critical. And, like, it's probably unfair. But I am looking towards, you know, it's only a few months away now, July 1st, when they're probably going to announce an extension for him. Mm. And it's like, bro, if you're going to be the highest paid player on this team, you can't be the guy who shrinks like one, I can't live through that again. <laughs> I don't believe that happened with Giroux. I think he drugged teams to the playoffs. That probably and then shouldn't was, have been there. And then was kind of just hurt because yeah. like he took bad teams to the playoffs, him and Jake basically on their shoulders, without a defenseman, without a goalie. But like it did happen. Yeah. We did watch it happen. The playoffs would start and all of a sudden Claude Giroux wasn't dynamic anymore. Like, I don't want to live through that again. And I don't know what the alternative is. Like, do you then trade Travis Konechny? And then where the hell are we? You know? like And then there's, I mean, we've talked about this. Like, yeah. there's a case to trade Travis Konechny. There is. From a timeline standpoint, from the, the, the contract that he is likely going to require, the reason why I just don't talk about it that much on the show is because I don't think they're going to do it. I don't so think. So it's almost yeah. like, yeah, you can talk about it as a, as a theoretical concept, but, like, I think they're going to re-sign him. So I just kind of feel like I'm wasting my breath. By talking about no, the trade him or keep him thing, but look, we have a whole off season. We'll we'll talk about it. Oh, <laughs> yes, there will be trade or keep Travis Konechny shows coming to you, maybe in a couple of weeks. You know, <laughs> but like that is the conversation now. Like, oh, uh, we both think they're going to resign him. They're probably going to announce it on or around July first, as soon as he's eligible for the extension. How much money has he cost himself, or are the Flyers overpaying for a guy who? Man, when when the spring comes around, I know it's not fair, but it's so 2020 weird. happened. It's so and now weird this too. happened again. But like, he just seems like a guy who would be great this time of year. It, he's the one. Like, <laughs> he's the dude. You like, if Travis Sanheim started to suck in the playoff, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I like. I, I this is not to, but like, you think of it as the soft guys, maybe you know, the more perimeter kind yeah. of guys. And TK mixes it up more than anyone not named Garnett Hathaway on this yeah. team. He, like, you would yeah. think he's one of the dudes who would... And it just hasn't worked that way, and it's disappointing. And I think that's why we have to have that conversation. You, but, you, know, you know one guy, before you get into this, ad, yeah, yeah. one guy who... Because you talked about people who were learning things about and not necessarily in a good way, but like, hey, information is information. information. One guy who I will say I feel like I'm learning some negative things about. And he, he's not like a core guy or anything, but like, I am significantly lower today than I was two months ago on Yeager Zamola. Like, I just don't Ooh, know if he's got it. Yeah. I mean, he was 
fine most of the year. He had some good games. Yeah. He impressed us at times. Yeah. But overall, it was like, all right, they might have a nice third-pair defenseman here. Cool. Yeah. It, it, not good. Yeah, not, it not, is not, not over the good. last couple of it weeks. It has not been good lately. Like, as, as the pace of games has gotten higher, as the intensity has gone up, it just seems like he's lost. And, again, like... He's he's on a cheap deal. He's not necessarily a yeah, core like piece. But like you're learning about these kids. Yeah. And I in watching Zamula over this last stretch, I'm not nearly as certain that he is like a quality third pair defenseman. Like he let me put it this way, like I'll go into next summer and 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 next training camp thinking like, you know, he's in an open competition for a job. And if you know, Ronnie Adder or Adam Jenning or somebody outplays him. Like, I'm fine waving him. No, and that's the, like, he was only, and not only here. Like, you wanted to get a look at him. Yeah. But only here, really, because you didn't want to put him on waivers. Yeah. Like, okay, let's find out about him. Yeah, this let's is, find out. He's no longer waivers exempt. Let's find out about him this year. And you're finding stuff out. And now it's like, if you get the one of those, like, you got to, like, one got to go prompts. And it's Zamula, Adder, or Jenning. Right now, it's Zamula. Yeah, like, and the well, other two by the end of next season, I might they, feel the same way. But I'm well, ready a, to like yeah. make. I've made my determination. Well, well, there's He's, an element with Zamula where it's like, I mean, with those guys, you want to give them a shot. You want to yeah. see how they look. We gave Zamula a shot. He got his chance, we, and and you're hoping that he's a guy who's going to, as he gets more experience, trend upward. Instead, it was kind of like this, and then this. Yeah. Like he was trending upward, and then he trended back downward. And you would hope that like. In the second half of his first full NHL season, he would be improving, not regressing, and he seems like he's regressing, which is concerning for a guy who never was supposed to be an impact guy anyway. All right, let's get to uh, let let me tell you about Bagels and Company before we move on. Uh, I've been telling you about Bagels and Company all season, and it's because they've got some damn good bagels and damn good coffee. Whenever they drop stuff off here at the office, it is a free for all. Uh, our show usually on in the afternoon, or if we have post game, like we're I'm picking at the scraps and. Even if they've been sitting here all day, I'm eating them because they're freaking delicious. First thing you got to know about Bagels & Company, though, huge bagels, the best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here with Philly Love, and a huge variety of bagels, usually 15 to 20 different types available to choose from daily. And when you have that many different kinds of bagels, what do you need? A lot of cream cheeses, 30 different flavors to choose from at Bagels & Company, and the most important thing, an affordable brand. Who doesn't need affordable right now? You get a lot of food for cheap, and that includes the coffee. Do yourself a favor and get a Bagels & Co. coffee. You won't be disappointed. For the best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here in Philly, head to thebagelsandco.com slash store dash locator to find the Bagels & Company near you. All right, so that just kind of leads us to the well, last. Before we get into that, uh, we have a oh, super chat. Yeah, we do have the super chat. We got uh, another one from Gary B., our bud. I uh, think Frost will be dangled as trade bait. No, but I don't think that he's untouchable. Yeah, that's. I don't know if they're going to actively shop him because it's like, listen, I mean, if the Zegris talks pick up, sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, he'll uh, maybe his name comes up. Similar position, you know, similar age. Yeah. You're going to want to fill that with, uh, so maybe. But I don't know if they're going to be actively making calls about, like, we got to get Frost out of here. Yeah. I don't think, believe it this way. I don't I'm, think it's Kevin Hayes. I'm not expecting them to be like, trading Morgan Frost for a draft pick. Yeah. Like, it's not a thing where they're just trying to get rid of him and trying to maximize the value. I could see them trading him, but I think it would be a more of a hockey trade. A hockey trade, trade yeah. part of a package, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, but if someone calls, like, I don't think they're, oh, no. Yeah, like, we need Morgan Frost. <laughs> like, yeah, no, uh, the coach scratched him 10 times in the first half of the season. Yeah. Like, they ain't hanging up the phone. No. So, but it's an interesting question. Definitely something we will... Talk plenty about in the sure coming will. in the coming weeks. Um, the stuff on the goalies, Charlie. The the thing that got a ton of attention on the old Twitter.com today uh, was your oh, the, yeah, the quote yeah. that you put. And not like I want to say your quote. Like it was just you transcribing. Yeah, John Tortorella Tortorella said it. Yeah, and how it seems like what's going on in your quote tweets about it's it has to do with the Carter Hart situation and what they knew and didn't know what are people freaking well, out about it seems like the quote was this and he was talking about the goalie situation he was talking about the fact that they have really overworked Arison yeah. in Tortorella's mind and the quote was let's face it things got thrown into a really weird situation when we lost Carter but having said that we had discussions in the summer about the situation with Carter and figured something was going to go on right we've got to be honest about it I think what the reason why people were quote tweeting this like crazy is because there is a belief 
in certain sections of hockey Twitter that basically everybody in the league knew that who did it way in advance and that they were all that everyone was lying to there the was fans. at least a group yes of eight to ten guys yes that, that it was yeah. probably but, but, one or but, some but, of these but the idea yeah. was that like I, I think really the underlying the underlying frustration from the people that were quote tweeting me were the people that basically believed that if if the teams knew a guy was was involved in this the teams should have just sat the player regardless and the teams were hiding behind the fact that well we don't know for sure when actually they did and they just kept playing these guys because they will help them win games now this is a union issue it, that's the thing i think that gets gets undersold here is like i i don't think like the flyers had carter hart under contract and if they just decided well we're just going to have you as a healthy scratch for however long it takes for this to go, like Carter Hart and his camp would file a grievance. Yeah. Because like the- you can't just put them on LTIR. You need the players uh, consent to be put on LTIR. That's the only like yeah. you can't healthy scratch him. That's weird. I mean, I, say no I, guess, to that. I guess the argument that could be made is like, well, you could have waived him and let someone else All deal right. with it. That could that could have been done. But what you have to remember here about the situation is that like, did the Flyers know? I'm sure they knew more than they were they were revealing publicly. I'm sure they had a pretty good idea that Hart was one of the players in this situation. However, Carter Hart would it would make the argument, because he's certainly making this argument in court, that he did nothing wrong in this situation and all this was just a consensual thing. So yes, you they may have known that he was involved, but they did not know if he did anything wrong. Now, you can make the case that like, oh, well, you know, if he was involved, he definitely did something wrong, but that's not the way any of this works. Yeah. The 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 likelihood that he did something wrong in this situation goes significantly up the minute he gets charged. And he got charged. And now he's not playing. I don't know. I, I get the frustration. And I understand why the quote trees are happening. However, I don't think this was any new revelation. That's that, the, that, like, that, that, oh, the, well, oh, the teams lied to us. They didn't, they said they didn't know, but they knew like if the flyers weren't preparing for the possibility of losing Carter Hart at some point this year, that was a dereliction of duty. Stupid. Yeah. yeah like, like, like we were, everyone was talking about this. It was a major topic of conversation on any, the show. Anyone who was on the team, like if you had a guy on that team, you had to be in some way prepared. Like you can't just, well, you know, we'll wait to see what happens. Like you have to have the conversation Especially, like, we're talking about the goaltender here. Yeah. Like, who, what, I, I understand people thinking this, and, like, yeah, it is icky. Like, oh, it is. so it's we just, it's, it's, we it's just, an awful situation. We just kind of, we just kind of knew and that we, something was probably yeah. going to happen. And we and played him anyway. He was just, like, yeah. his jersey's available in the store. Yeah. Like, yeah, that is, I don't like it. Yeah. But I also recognize this is a legal situation. We're talking about contracts, we're talking about unions. The NHL and the Philadelphia Flyers do not want to tarnish their brand if they can avoid it. I have to believe until I'm presented with other information that this was their only realistic option. Yeah. That's, yeah. I might be well, wrong. Well, and, and it was, it was the same thing because some people were making this argument about like the players, like how could they have stayed friends with Carter Hart if they knew that he was involved in this? And my answer was always like, I mean, they might've known he was involved, but Carter was telling them I didn't do anything wrong. Like, yeah, it was fine. Like, don't worry. Like all the stuff you're hearing is bullshit. And like, if he's your friend, I understand why you would trust your friend. You believe your friends. Even if, even if your friend is lying to you. (laughs) Absolutely. It's, it, the whole thing is shitty, and like I hate having to talk about it, but it is. I mean, we talk about how many crazy things have happened this year, and this one is like it's in a level. Yeah. Like there's tier. Like the Cutter Gauthier thing is a wild story, but it, it doesn't really impact anyone's life, you know, the way the way the Carter Hart thing does. It's just two totally different uh, situations. And I think we've done a pretty good job of handling it, but it does. I understand why people are unhappy and feel weird about it. I just, I wonder what else could have been done within the confines of like understanding that the NHLPA ain't going to let you sit them. Yeah. Like that's not going to happen. And I know we get frustrated with that in all sports. Like, oh, the union's going to bat for this. That's the union's job. 
They pay their dues. Yeah. The union goes to bat for you. Yeah. It's just one of the things that happens, yeah. you know. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, this this season, <laughs> this season has. If anyone needs to chill, it's us, man. Uh, Coors Light has been with us, and thank God they have been there with me all weekend as well. Thank you, Coors Light. Uh, listen, this team, they drive us nuts, and they're going to continue to drive us nuts in the offseason. We're going fre- to be freaking out about them just because the regular season is ending and they might not make the playoffs doesn't mean I'm going to chill out any bit. So I just need to step back sometimes, just need to chill myself, and there's no better way to chill than with and ice cold Coors Light. So whether you're freaking out about the goaltenders, injuries, the draft lottery now, you need to find the Blue Mountains in your fridge and enjoy a beer as cold as the Rockies. Because when everything surrounding your favorite hockey team is on fire, sometimes you just got to chill. When you choose to rise above it all, choose chill, choose Coors Light. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash P-H-L-Y hockey. Celebrate responsibly Coors Brewing Company. Golden, Colorado. And I guess the thing we'll close with now. This is kind of, you know, when I was talking to Gargano this morning, because he's like, you know, the expectations for this. Like, uh, you have to still be pleased considering what you thought they were going to be. Right. And my thing is, while I'm not freaking out totally about this collapse, it's not good. And the thing that bothers me about it is if you are going to be team that we're bigger than the you know some of our parts and our culture is what carries us through these tough moments to suddenly just be getting beaten down in these tough moments does it make you rethink the culture i think the question has to be asked because yeah if you're going it's what we said about john tortorella about the idea that like if you're going to give him credit for you know 65 games or how great of a job he's done he deserves some blame for the seven game losing streak that likely will knock them out of a a playoff you know the playoff race it's the same thing with the culture if you're going to say that the culture was so important to get them to this point then you can't then hand wave it away when they lose seven straight games in the middle of a playoff race like if the culture was that strong would this happen maybe but like it's certainly worth bringing up and the the com the comparison i made in my article was to the Eagles and the Eagles collapsed because that was a great comparison because this is the thing like we we spent years championing the strength of the Eagles culture yep. they went out and they took a big swing on Jalen Carter in large part because they're like our culture is so strong yeah. that we can integrate this guy even though there are character concerns nevertheless when the chips were down when shit got tough they folded. Yep. All that culture didn't matter. They still completely fell apart at the end of the season and then got the, their doors and, blown yeah, off. No show to playoff yeah, game. By a, by a team that they that have. Has Baker Mayfield. Yeah. The, the team that they that has less talent yes. than them blew them out in a playoff game. And it makes you think like, was that culture really as strong as we all thought? I think this has to at least, at least has to have you ask the question of, you know, and to me, the big part of this is what Briere takes away from because had they, you know, played out this this season, made the playoffs, did or had a really good showing in the first round, it would have been significantly easier. I feel like for Danny Briere to be like, I can't mess with this team. You know, they 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 got something special going. You know, they they just play so hard for each other. Yeah. Our culture is so strong. After this, like, I really like Scott Lawton, but like, you know, if you're keeping him for the culture. Like, and the team fell apart. And the team fell apart. Like, maybe that culture, it's not that it doesn't exist. It might still be strong, but it's maybe not something you have to, it's, like, prioritize at all costs. It's not going to win you the championship. What's going to win you the championship is the great players. Right. Like, it's important, but it's not the most important. Yes. Like, the most important is still having the great players. Yes. And, whereas, whereas if you yeah. if you held this for 82 games and really were win a first round do, or something. doing it on yeah. the culture, then it's easier for you to be like, well, maybe this is really important. This does serve as a little bit of a reminder that culture only goes so far. It, uh, you, you still have to just like go out and do it. Yeah. Like it, the culture isn't this magic. It's not Mike's magic stuff or whatever it was. Oh, uh, the Space secret Jam. stuff in Space Jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's not that. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, well, we're, we're mentally tougher than everyone. So we're going to, yeah, man, you got your doors blown off by Columbus and Columbus is B team. Yeah. Like, no, the culture isn't just propelling you to these great heights and we'll close on. And and maybe it's, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Maybe it really is. Maybe 
this will allow them to disabuse themselves of the delusion that the culture will solve everything. We have to have Scott Lawton. Like, we need guys. Like, we need not just one Nick Sealer. We need three Nick Sealers. Like, now you need one. (laughs) All right, I'll give you the one. I'll give you the one. (laughs) We we don't need 50% of our defense. But I'll just close on this one thing. It's a little funny. Um, All year we've talked about, like, the difference between this team and the ones of the past and how things don't snowball. They're on the seven-game losing streak. Charlie, there's four games left. They can do it. They can do it. They can lose 10 in a row. They could do it. They can lose 11 in a row. Oh, my God. (laughs) That is all the time we have for you. It's great that it it could took to the final 11 games, but they finally got their 10-game losing streak in. That's just... All right. That is all the time we have for you on PHLY Flyers. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. We'll be back tomorrow night for post-game. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed or is enjoying the Eclipse, whatever's going on. My name is Bill Matz. That's Charlie O'Connor. Have a great week, Philly. We all silly like the mayor. 